I was raised in a ranch in Zimbabwe, uh, where my father and his brothers had over 10,000 head of cattle. At a very difficult, difficult stage of our history where there wasn't uh, supplementary feed available. Our environment is tropical, what we call tropical sour felt. Sour felt in our language, uh, which is used in, in South Africa, and Southern Africa, means range that is very low octane grazing. In other words, high rainfall, leach soils, I think some of you are familiar with that, as opposed to what I would call the high octane type grazing, the Western United States drier country. The difference being that for every mouthful of food or grass that a cow takes, high octane grazing, one mouthful is equivalent to about two or three or four mouthfuls in the low octane grass. And that is a big problem. So we grew up in that environment where we had that problem of very poor quality grazing. Um, at a time when supplements weren't available, and luckily a, a cattle scale wasn't available either. Because I think we've done a lot of damage by weighing cattle. It's not to say that weighing cattle is wrong, it's how we interpret those results. So what we've done over the last 50 or 60 years by performance testing cattle is we, all we've done is we've changed the genotype to one that requires better nutrition in order to be productive. And I'll explain how, what, what I mean by that. So what we need to do is we need to breed cattle that under poor nutrition can still be productive. So it's all about body condition. If you think about it in, in terms of ranching, everything revolves around body condition. If we don't have body condition, if we don't get it through breeding, then we have to get it through feeding. So we have the option of increasing body condition through feeding or breeding, or a combination of both. So I grew, grew up in that situation, and then I, I studied under uh, Professor Jan Bonsma, as some of you might have heard of him, at the University of Pretoria, where I got an academic uh, degree, background in academic animal science. And fortunately, I turned down an offer by him to stay on in his department as a lecturer. And the reason why I did that is I always wanted to go back to land. I wanted to do things for myself. I wanted to practice what I learned on, on the ground. And that's the best decision I ever made in terms of my career. So I went back and I acquired a ranch and I started ranching physically, practically myself. And that's where the learning really started. Because I saw very quickly on that there's a big discrepancy be between what the experts say and what is happening on the land. On the land, I saw many uh, challenges. I wouldn't call them problems. But I also saw many opportunities that those people that sit behind desks don't see. It's not their fault. The fault lies with our education system. Our education system is totally wrong. Because those people that have academic careers are totally uh, uh, isolated from what's happening on the ground. So by going back, that is, I started to uh, learn more, and then I made many, many, many mistakes, fortunately, and luckily I think I learned by those mistakes. Uh, in 1975, I imported Lester Beef Master semen from the Lester Ranch in Colorado. You familiar with the Beef Master, Lester Beef Master? I upgraded a herd to uh, basically Lester the Beef Master, but I adapted to my tropical conditions. And then in 1995, I realized that what I was doing with the cattle, in a sense, was good in terms of breeding, but those same cattle were destroying the land that I was, had them on. In other words, I had to change my grazing system. But many years back, prior to that, I'd been in contact with Alan Savory. I grew up when Alan Savory became very popular in terms of what he was uh, preaching in terms of grazing management. So I was aware of what he was saying. But I was also aware that under our conditions of very poor nutrition and very fibrous grass, grass that goes two meters tall, six, seven foot tall. I had to manage the cattle at extremely high densities for two reasons. One, we need this high impact on the land to improve the land, break up the soil surface, break up the compaction, aerate the soil, knock down litter, grass that's not being grazed. But I also realized I had to go very high densities for the sake of the cattle. Because in our environment, if you put cattle into a small paddock for a, a day, it's impossible for them to eat all that grass. Because the density, in a sense, is too high, but not high enough. It's too high in the sense that the cattle foul the area very quickly, and then they won't graze. So I realized very quickly I had to go to very high densities. And when I moved the cattle four times a day, uh, I could utilize all the grass, at least four times a day I had to do it. 
So I realized I had to go to VR densities. But the problem was how, in 1995, when I started, how do you implement those extremely high densities in a practical situation? Conventional fencing is impossible. You can't do it. So I had to devise a system where I could do it with very cheaply, and I realized in the back of my mind that the, the, the answer was lied in electric fences, portable electric fences or semi-portable or even permanent, depending on the environment. So I started on the 12th of January, 1995. I'll never forget, I had a herd of 95 cows. I put it at very high density. I moved them between four and eight times a day. That's equivalent to between 1,000 and 2,000 packs per herd. Why I mention that is not to frighten people off, because 2,000 paddocks a herd sounds uh, impossible to achieve. But the point I'm trying to make is it was possible to achieve, and wherever I've gone here in the United States, we don't need to go to those extremely high densities. What we have to do is we will have to increase the densities, but it'll be more like hundreds of paddocks per herd as opposed to thousands of paddocks per herd, depending on the environment. 12th of January I started, I had, I had I'd sold a, another property, so I had cattle on hand, which I can use to double my stocking rate. They were on lease grazing near, nearby. Within a week, because in our situation uh, with low octane grasses, the conventional management uh, resulted in the cattle only grazing half the grass. So they would, they would initially go into paddock, they would graze. You take them out, come back, and they would graze those same patches again. So to get the, 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 the performance up in terms of body condition, we were uh, only utilizing half the grass. So occasionally we'd have to burn that grass. So I came into a situation where half the grass wasn't utilized. So I was, I was able to double my stocking rate within a week. I realized within a week, if I carried on like this, I would, it would take me two years to go through the property in terms of grazing. So I doubled my stocking rate. Um, that is not the case everywhere, particularly the drier parts of the United States where you have very high octane grazing. There you actually have to grow more grass. But I think in most situations, we can increase our, stock, our stocking rate by better utilization. Two years later, down the line, I tripled my stocking rate because I grew more grass and utilized it well. And then when I had to leave my property after seven years of doing high density grazing, I could have quadrupled my stocking rate. And I've done a lot of work in Southern Africa, and I would say the potential is between two and four times what we have at the moment in terms of stocking rate. There are exceptional cases which might be higher. I've never seen anywhere where you can't double it. And I think tripling, quadrupling is within the reach of most of us. So that's the background. So what I'm going to talk about, uh, what we're going to talk about in the next few two days is two things. Cattle have a dual role. We have to understand that. Cattle have to convert grass efficiently into a product that we can market, either milk or beef. That's very important. Most of us will understand that and agree with that. But the problem is that the, our selection criteria and selection and management uh, breeding practices are counterproductive. We're not breeding cattle that are efficient grass converters. We are only breeding cattle that require better nutrition to be productive. So we have to change that and breed cattle that are efficient grass converters. Because we have X amount of grass on our property and we have to utilize that very efficiently. That's the one role. The other role, very important, is that we have to use those same cattle to improve the land by changing the grazing system, higher densities, more greater impact. And to be able to do that without losing too much body condition, you also have to have cattle that can have an inherently high body condition. And that inherently high body condition comes from efficient grass conversion. So basically that's what we can talk about. What we also talk about is changing your, uh, getting your production system, your carving season in line with uh, nutrition, natural nutrition. And the fourth one is also very important, is by using supplements other minerals or protein to be able to help cattle digest grass more efficiently. So it's a natural process. Digestion of grass, bacteria in the, in, the, in the rumen is a natural process. And if we can enhance that natural process, I think that's very good. So when you're talking about supplementary feeding, we're not talking about substitute feeding. We're not talking about grain, we're talking about nutrient minerals and in particular protein to digest very lignified high fiber grasses. What's the most important factor determining profitability in a ranch? Reproduction. Reproduction. That's true. Everyone agrees with that. We don't agree, disagree with that. So what I'd like to do is I'll just go through an exercise here, and then we put some figures to it. 
in the back of the notes here, I've got it in kilograms and hectares, but the Americans haven't caught up yet. So what we'll do is, I think I'm going to use acres and, and uh, pounds, if that makes more sense to you. If you speak to one of your cattle rancher friends, and you start talking about production, and he starts bragging about his, what he gets in terms of his productivity and profit, what will he talk about? He'll talk about winning weights. We'll talk about carbon percent, or you talk about uh, how heavy his carcasses are at, 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 at uh, his carcasses, or how big his cattle are. Now, if you, so what every cattle rancher and conventionally talks about production or profit per animal, would you agree with me? Very few talk about production or profit per acre. If you speak to a farmer who grows crops, maize, corn, he talks about bushels or kilograms or tons per hectare. Very different. Now, if our goal is production per animal or profit per animal, it's very simple to achieve that. We just go and buy the biggest cattle with the most milk, and we keep very few of them in a large piece of land so they can selectively graze. And then we feed them as well. So we get very high production per animal. Now, that's totally contrary to what, if our goal is maximum sustainable profit per hectare or acre, as I'm going to talk about. So all your management and breeding practices are contrary to that. So if our goal is maximum sustainable profit per acre, and I'm sure that's why you're here today, then we have to use very different breeding and management practices. Okay. So we're going to talk from a perspective of a, of a goal of maximum sustainable profit per acre. What I'd like to do for this, uh, for this exercise is I need a piece of land, say 1,000 acres, One thousand acres on which we will just carry cows and wean calves from them. So we just need to know how many acres we have and how many cows we can carry. Now, what will a thousand acres? Um, what will be the value of a thousand acres of land? I know it varies from environment to environment, but let's take a reasonable example where uh, we don't have other factors that increase the price of land. Let's just look at something. Uh, what, what, what would it cost you in your area to buy a thousand acres for cattle? How many million dollars? One and a half million. <laughs> okay. So the value of land capital, I can put it that way, would be three million dollars. I'm familiar with dollars too because in our country now, I don't know if you understood the history of our country, we don't have, we use uh, US dollars now. Zimbabwe dollars went extinct a couple of years ago. At one stage, inflation was 50% a day. So you can imagine what happens in a situation like that. So I'm familiar with US dollars. Okay, what would be the, you know, we paid $3 million for 1,000 acres. How many, conventionally, how many, how many cows do you be able to carry on that piece of land? What would the stocking rate be? 300. Sorry? 300. They said 300 cows? 350. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the figures in, and then we'll have a, and then we'll explain how, what I'm trying to show you here. So I'm going to write in here, number of cows, 300. Okay. Now what you have here in this conventional, I've got a conventional system here and a sustainable system. The sustainable system is what I did when I increased my stocking rate. I changed the type of uh, cattle I had genotype through breeding and the number of paddocks, which all had a positive influence on the body condition and productivity of the land. Okay. But I don't have figures to put to this. I'm going to make some assumptions in the figures we're going to put there, and I'll explain later how I make those assumptions. Okay. What we have here is a conventional system with a trial they did in Zimbabwe in, 19, in the 1970s where Alan Savory was involved. Uh, Charter Estate was a big ranch, made land available. And they had a conventional system of one herd to four paddocks. So what they had as a control, they had a conventional system at conventional stocking rates. That's a buy one. So that would be equivalent to our 300 cows. When Savi uh, looked at his system of 16 paddocks, very low number of paddocks, he doubled stock numbers because the, there was enough grass to do that. So he arbitrarily doubled stock numbers. So from 300, you went to 600 cows here. Now, over a seven-year period, they looked at the, uh, 
the carving rate, carving percentage of the cows, and they also looked at weaning weights. And the, the average carving uh, percentage for those cows over a period of seven years, in this case, was 80%. And here with the doubled numbers, it came down to 67%. We can understand why. Because doubling cattle numbers, they were now forcing the cattle to eat all the grass. So the cattle we had, we had a poor nutritional level. So that's why it came down from 80% to 67%. That would be equivalent to what you'd have in the high rainfall areas here, where you would have to force cattle to eat all the grass, which is one of the things we're talking about, non-selective grazing, is, very, is, is extremely important. Okay, the winning weights, uh, for these cows here, it was, two, it was 550 pounds over that period. And here it came down to 500 pounds, 10% drop. Okay, now, what, what I'd like to use here to uh, um, make assumptions for this side, which is sustainable, is you understand that there's a relationship between body condition and, and cow fertility. Everyone understands that. The better conditioned cows are up to a point, the higher the fertility is going to be. Okay, so they've done work in Southern Africa on a body condition scale of one to five. Uh, the average body condition for cows that would give a 80% carving rate would be 2.6. And 67 would be equivalent to 2.4. So body condition of that will give you 80%. A body condition score of that will give you 67%. Okay, that's not a very big difference in body condition score. It makes a very big difference in your carving rate. So there we can see the opportunities we have in terms of management by increasing body condition a little bit through supplementation. It can make a very big difference on carving rate and obviously on the, 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 the profitability of, a, of an operation. Okay, now what I'm going to do is we've got 300 cows here because you double stocking rate to 600. We've got 600 here. This is sustainable. In my case, I double stocking rate and then I triple stocking rate. Now the problem here is I'm going to look at cow size as well. And I give these two extreme cow sizes, 1,320 and 660, not suggesting that you should either use 300, 300 pound cows or 660 pound cows. In Africa we do have 660 pound cows, so they are available. It's just to prove a point. I'm using double the cow size to make you understand the very important principle. Okay, now if I have, if I double stock, if I have um, 300, cows that weigh 320 pounds, how many cows of 660 pounds can I carry? Which is half the size of that. Sorry? One would think 600, but it's not the case. If you look at all the mammals in the world, if you look at mice and you look at uh, your elephant and rhino, which animals have the fastest reproductive rate or maturity rate? Your small animals or your large animals? Small animals. Okay, there's a very good reason for that. And that holds true within a species of animals, cattle. It holds true within a herd of cattle as well. The reason, the thing, the reason being is that uh, there's a biological fact that intake is not proportional to size. Intake is proportional to a, a function of size. Uh, and I, don't, I don't want to get too technical, but it's metabolic size. So metabolic size, uh, metabolic size of a 320 pound cow would be that weight 1,320 to the power of 0.75. I'll explain that later. So just understand that. So we cannot carry 600 pound cows, 600 or 1,200 cows in this case here. We can't carry 1,200 pound cows, uh, 1,200 cows that are half the size of these ones here. By virtue of the fact that smaller animals eat more relative to their size. So we have to take that into consideration. Okay, I'm going to tell you how to do it, and then we just write the figures down, and when I finish this, I'll explain exactly how I come to that figure.